Good morning and welcome to worship on this Reformation Day. I'm sorry about that. Um, we've just had our technical difficulty for the day, I hope. Um, it was on this day in 1517 that a monk named Martin Luther, living in an obscure college town, working at an obscure college in an obscure college town in, called Wittenberg in Germany, went to the church doors and nailed 95 theses or questions for debate to the church doors. Actually, to be fair, he probably just nailed either a short summary or, um, or an announcement about these theses and that he wanted to debate them because the actual set of theses is about yay thick, and I don't think he did that. Um, and no, neither do most historians. He'd have had to have a railroad spike. Um, but Luther did this, and this is the point at which people say the Protestant Reformation was started. Now, a couple of things you should know. One of them is that this was not a hugely dramatic act. Again, he probably just nailed a summary or an announcement about these to the door. Two, in the days before Facebook and um, online bulletin boards, and for those of us who feel like we're very old, in the, t in the community bulletin boards that used to be all over college towns with cork boards and things and you put push pins and staples in them, before all of that, the way that people spread the word in a college town was they nailed things to the church doors because everybody would become a church eventually and everybody would see the announcements. So there were probably things about, you know, the, um, the college tutoring, tutoring session and, um, the group community barbecue and all those other announcements stuck on the church doors along with Luther's theses. So this wasn't that big and dramatic an act. The other thing you should know is that it wasn't really the start of the Protestant Reformation. We all think of it as the start of the Reformation now, be, both because Luther's message spread much more quickly because shortly before the, he had gotten started on his Reformation, Another fellow in Germany had invented a newfangled thing called a printing press with movable type. And so things could get printed much more easily and distributed. And so that was a big part of the revolution. 
but also somewhere along there, the Lutherans just had better publicists than everybody else. Ulrich Zwingli, a reformed reformer, had been at work about a decade before Luther already doing things in Zurich. And um, other reformers like Jan Hus and John Wycliffe had been at work decades and centuries before Luther, and nobody had noticed them. So Luther gets noticed, and that's the big, the big deal. Um, and, but this is the day we remember the Protestant Reformation. We celebrate the bravery of the reformers who stood up to the bureaucracy and the power of the church and said, wait, there is something we're missing here. And we also lament that in being impatient, as many of them were, the church got broken. And rather than talking through things, people drew up sides and fractured the church into many little parts that we have, have today. But we remember all of that, and we remember that God is continually reforming our, us each and every day so that we may be better at following God's call in our lives. So keeping that all in mind, and now that we are past the technical difficulties and God will be reforming Pastor James so that he, re he, never, he never goes into worship without the lavalier and the wireless mic running through, his, um, running through his robe and where they're supposed to be again, at least not for a very long time, um, we celebrate and we join together. I invite you to read along any of the lines that are in bold print in the bulletin. You should see the bulletin on the left-hand side of your screen through most of worship. If you are on a phone and get the church's emails, you got it in an email yesterday. And um, if you don't get those emails, send your email address to the, to the church office here, office at Presbyterian New Brunswick, like Presbyterian New Brunswick was all one word, dot O-R-G and we will make sure you get added to that email list and you get those emails and you'll get the bulletins. Um, but otherwise, it's on the left-hand side of your screen. Follow along, read aloud the things that are in bold print, even though you're muted. Sing along with the songs. When we come to the time to share joys and concerns before the prayers, we will invite folks to unmute. And then at the end of worship, um, we will turn off the recording and invite folks to turn their cameras on and their mutes off so that we can all be sharing together. Children are encouraged to have some paper and pencil or crayons handy so that they can um, do, work on some pictures during the sermon, and we will talk about that right before the scripture time as we get ready for things. So we begin with our gathering song, and Chris is going to play through it, and then we will all sing together. worship God. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. My mouth is filled with God's praise. Let every living thing bless God's holy name forever and always. Chris is going to play through the psalm and then we will all sing together.
I'll praise my Maker while I've breath. I'll praise from birth until my death. Each thought and act a hallelujah. No mortals can be counted on. No matter what their plans are gone. All turn to dust just as they do. Such blessings come for those who found such hope in God, who is the ground of Israel's prosperity. The one who made earth, seas, and skies, the world that grows, runs, swims, and flies, God makes the hungry fed and blessed and opens every captive cell. Restores the mind with brand new sight, relieves the burdened by great might, loves those who do God's work as well. Those who are strangers need not roam, those landing Find a home in God who stops those who do wrong, who runs the whole of history's stage, who is with us in every age. I'll praise my God, my life a song. Beloved in God, I greet you with God's great words grace and peace. Glory to God forever. Amen. And now let us confess our sins and leave our burdens at God's feet so that we may go forth free and forgiven, living out the promise of our baptism. Let us do all this beginning with the prayer you see on the left side of your screen. Let us pray. Creator of love and life, you call us to show your love as partners in your ongoing creation. But your world is complex. Often it is difficult to know how your love should appear. Forgive us for our fear to take a stand. Forgive us for our failures to make difficult decisions. Forgive us for hiding in talk of love that does not act. Help us to be bold, but not belligerent. Help us to be decisive, but not divisive. Help us in our love to be unified by the Spirit who fills us. Hear these words that we may trust from the Apostle Paul. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Always be gentle with others. The Lord will soon be here. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. With thankful hearts, open up your prayers and requests to God. Let the peace that no one can completely understand control the way you think and feel. Whatever is true and pure and right and holy, whatever is friendly and proper and excellent and worthy of praise, we will think about these things. And God, who gives us peace, will be with us. Believe this good news and live in peace. All reminds us and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The peace of Christ is always with you, and also with you. Let us greet one another in the peace of Christ.
Okay. Hello? For those of you who are watching along on Zoom, if you're still able to get the signal, um, we apologize. There seems to be a problem in Zoom world that um, they're not sharing with us what the problem is or how to fix it because that would just be no fun. It would take away from us the joy of discovery. Um, and um, so Chris is experiencing the joy of discovery back in the corner even as we speak. Um, we'll talk about, we'll do as best we can as we go along this morning. And I would, this is our time to invite children and those who are young at heart to um, talk for a moment before we have our Bible story. So we're going to do this, hoping that at the very least we're still recording and um, that part will work. This Sunday and next Sunday, we're going to be talking about something in worship called stewardship. Pretty big word, stewardship. But basically, it means making good use of all the gifts God gives us. So, and God gives us all different gifts. It depends on what kind of work we do and how we get paid and all that stuff. But for today, while we think about stewardship a little bit, I would like you to imagine that you're an apple farmer. And so you're an apple farmer. And one day, this time of year, as you go out and you do your harvesting, these are the apples gotten off of one of your trees, probably one of the smaller trees. The other trees have had lots of other apples, but we're just going to use these because we don't want to have a whole room full of apples. Now, so you imagine you've got these 10 apples off your apple tree, one of your trees. There are other trees, so you're not going to die. There's been lots of apples, but you take those 10 apples. Here is how good stewardship, the way God would like us to do it, works. We take the very first apple out of 10. This is the one. Make sure it's a good one. Yeah. This is the one we're going to give back to God. So we set that aside. That's our apple to give back to God. Okay. And we do that first before anything else, because we trust that God is going to give us enough that even when we give away a tenth of all our stuff right away to God, we're going to have enough. That's why we do it. Not because the church has bills to pay, not because, oh yeah, there are hungry children somewhere in the world who need something, but because we trust God and we love God that much that we give the first tenth back right away. 
and that's called a tithe. But really, a tithe is whatever amount you decide in advance, whatever percentage you decide in advance you're going to give back. As long as you've just done that prayerfully and you've decided this is the percentage I'm giving back this, this year. And you do that every week, no matter what. And you do it first because that's to show I trust God to make sure that I have enough. So there's our first apple that went to the tithe. And here we go. So we've got nine apples left here in this bag. Well, let's see. We're going to have to pay taxes. And we're going to do that because we are citizens and the government provides us with things. And also, by the way, we don't get a choice. So two apples, two apples are taxes. Those are going to be our taxes. So how many? We've still got seven apples. Okay, so our seven apples that are left, we're going to take a couple more of these apples. We're going to take a couple of the apples maybe that don't look so fancy or maybe have blemishes on them. And we're going to say, these apples, we're going to take the seeds out of so that we can plant new trees so that they will grow up so that by the time some of our trees get too old to make apples anymore, we've got new trees ready. So these are getting us ready for the future and those are setting aside. So there's still five apples in this bag. We're, we're doing okay. And so out of these 10 apples, and remember there's lots of trees and lots of apples probably on one day. If you've got a big orchard, there's been a thousand apples and we're only dealing with 10 of them. Okay, so we're gonna take we've, these five more apples and we're going to take, let's say three of them. These are gonna be the apples that we eat. These are gonna be for us. Nice apples, that'll be good. And then we've still got two more and we're gonna take these apples and we're gonna take them and put them with some others. And maybe we've got a farm stand out by the, out by the road, or we've got, a, we've got a deal with the market down, down, down the way. And we're gonna take these apples and we're gonna sell them. And that's gonna give us the other money we need so that we can have heat and clothes and all that fun stuff. And again, there's been lots of apples and lots of trees, so we're okay. That stewardship work. We figure out our percentages in advance, and maybe you're gonna say, well, no, I'd really rather sell three apples and eat two apples, that, that's okay. And maybe you're gonna say, well, I'm not quite ready to give God a whole apple out of every 10, and I'm only gonna give God half an apple out of so a whole apple out of every 20. Well, you pray about that and you decide that, that can be okay too, as long as you stick to whatever you've decided in advance, because that's all about trusting God. But this is the way we do our stewardship. So I want you to be thinking about that. And when I'm talking about stewardship with the grown-ups during the sermon, be thinking about, okay, it's how we take the stuff that we get. And we use a little for this and a little for that. Maybe you're saving up for something special. So a little of your of whatever you get is going into your savings. All of those things are important and you figure that out. And that means that maybe, maybe this week, you don't have enough to go out and get that cool thing you saw on Amazon. But you know, you save for a couple of weeks and then you can. Because all of that, that's stewardship. Sometimes we call it budgeting. But an important part of it is that trusting God at the beginning. And why do we trust God? Because God always takes care of us. And that's where we get to our Bible stories today. We have a story from Deuteronomy where Moses is talking to all the Israelites. They're getting ready to go to the promised land. They're almost there. And Moses says, now, when you get to this land that we're going to, Remember how you need to behave. Remember the laws that we learned back at Mount Sinai. And we're going to remember God is our God. God is one. God always is there for us. So that God is our God and God is one is the part we always remember. It is part of a prayer 
the Jewish people pray called the Shema. Shema in, in Hebrew means hear. So they're hearing. It's hear, O Israel. God is your God and God is one. And then they remember that that means we love God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind and all our strength. And we love our neighbors. We love the people around us just as much as we love ourselves because the way that we love God, since we don't ever see God face to face, we can say, oh yeah, we love God. Lots of us know people who are far, who live far away. And sometimes it's very easy to love the people who live far away because we don't have to see them. <laughs> but it's where we love our neighbors and how we take care of our neighbors that shows how we love God. Because if we love God and if we trust that God is our God and God is one and God is always taking care of us, which is how we can do our tithing, then we can trust that we can be nice to all of our neighbors and not just be looking out for ourselves. And God is still going to take care of us. Even when bad things happen, God is going to take care of us and it's going to work out down the road. Even when Zoom is not working and Pastor James has forgotten his microphone and all of those things. God is taking care of us. Then our other Bible story that comes from Mark, and it's all of these people coming and talking to Jesus, different ones, and they come, it seems like they're coming one after another, and that's how it gets remembered in this story. They're all coming one after another, but they're saying, well, maybe there's this exception to when we love God, and we should really be looking out for ourselves, and maybe there's this exception, and maybe there's this, Jesus is saying, no. All look out for each other all the time. We always love God with all our heart and soul and strength. And we always love our neighbors because God's love is always more than enough. So I want you to be thinking about that. To be thinking about that, about how we do our stewardship, to be thinking about that, how about how we, on this Reformation Day, we remember that we're always reformed, reformed, rebuilt into something else. Be thinking about that when you're going out tonight. I'll bet you're going out doing some trick-or-treating and you're putting on costumes. And we put on costumes about people we love, people sometimes about heroes, people we admire, sometimes just people we think are cool or people we think are scary. And God loves all of those important and cool and scary and beloved people. All of those people who make us laugh and cry and do all those things that we put on costumes for. All of them are loved by God and we're loved by God. And so we can love all of them and we can trust God to take care of everything. So there's what I'd like you to remember. Of course, before we have stories in church, we always say a prayer. And at the end of the prayer, we always say amen. So the grown-ups are invited to join me within the, in the prayer. And then at the end of the prayer, as loud as you can, say amen. Let's pray. God of covenant, who gives us ears to hear and voices to proclaim your good news, who gives us hands to reach out to one another and arms to open, welcoming everyone in who inspires us with your own breath of life. Be with us now. Open our minds to grasp ever deeper mysteries in your word. Open our eyes to see not just what is, but what can be. Open our hearts to patiently understand your voice in each other. God who made us, illumine us, and make us your church. Amen. Okay. Listen for a word from God in this story from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses is speaking to all the Israelites. This is the commandment, the rules and regulations that God, your God, commanded me to teach you to live out in the land you're about to cross into to possess. This is so that you'll live in deep reverence before God lifelong, observing all God's rules and regulations that I'm commanding you. 
you and your children and your grandchildren living good, long lives. Listen obediently, Israel. Do what you're told so that you'll have a good, long life, a life of abundance and bounty, just as God, the God of our ancestors, promised in a land abounding in milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, God is our God and God alone. You shall love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Tie them to your, on your hand as a sign. Tie them on your forehead as a symbol. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. When God, your God, ushers you into the land God promised, through your ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you, you are going to walk into large, bustling cities that you didn't build, well-furnished houses you didn't buy, come upon wells you didn't dig, vineyards and olive orchards you didn't plant, and when you have eaten your fill, make sure you don't forget how you got there. God brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Deeply respect God, your God. Serve and worship God exclusively. Back up your promises with God's name only. Don't follow other gods, those gods of the people around you, because God, your God, who is alive among you, is a jealous God. God, your God's hot anger will burn right you right off the face of the earth. Don't test God, your God, the way you tested God at Massa. Carefully keep the commandments of God, your God, all the requirements and regulations God gave you. Do what is right and good in God's sight so that things will go well for you and you will enter and take possession of the wonderful land that God swore to your ancestors, throwing out your enemies left and right exactly as God said. In the future, when your children ask you, what is the meaning of the laws, the regulations, and the rules that God, our God, commanded us? Tell them, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. But God brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. We stood there and watched as God delivered miracle signs, great wonders, and evil visitations on Egypt, on Pharaoh, and on his household. God pulled us out of there to bring us here and give us the land God so solemnly promised to our ancestors. That's why God commanded us to follow all these rules so that we would live reverently before God, our God, as God gives us this good life, keeping us alive for a long time to come. If we diligently observe this entire commandment in the presence of God, our God, just as God commanded us to do, we will be in the right. And listen for a word from God in this story from the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. They sent some of the Pharisees and supporters of Herod to trap him in his words. They came to him and said, teacher, we know that you're genuine and you don't worry about what people think. You don't pander, but teach God's way as it really is. Tell us, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He knew it was a trick question and said, why are you playing these games with me? Bring me a coin and let me look at it. They handed him one. He said to them, whose image and inscription is this? Caesar's, they replied. And Jesus said, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and give to God what belongs to God. His reply left them speechless. Some Sadducees, who deny that there is a resurrection, came to Jesus and asked, Teacher, Moses wrote that if a man dies and leaves a wife but no child, his brother is obligated to marry the widow and have children. Now there were seven brothers. 
The first one married a woman. When he died, he left no children. The second married her and died without leaving any children. The third did the same. None of the seven left any children. Finally, the woman died. At the resurrection, when they all rise up, whose wife will she be? All seven were married to her. Jesus said, you're way off base, and here's why. One, you don't know what God said. Two, you don't know how God works. After the dead are raised up, they, will, they won't marry, and they won't be given in marriage. Instead, they will be like God's angels. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the story about the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? The living God is God of the living, not the dead. You're way, way off base. One of the religion scholars came up and saw how well Jesus had answered them. He came over and asked him, which commandment is most important of all? Jesus said the first in importance is, listen Israel, the Lord your God is one. So love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And here is the second. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment that is greater than these. The religion scholar said, a wonderful answer, teacher, so clear-cut and accurate that God is one and there is no other. And to love God with all of the heart, with a full understanding, and with all of one's strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is so much more important than all kinds of entirely burned offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered with wisdom, he said to him, you aren't, you aren't far from God's kingdom. After that, no one dared ask him any questions. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Hear, O Israel, and repeat after me. And I'm going to really want you to repeat. God is our God and God alone. God is our God and God alone. Now remember, in Hebrew, we only really hear when it changes our behavior. The word hear means you've got to do something, too. So hear, O Israel, and repeat after me. God is our God and God alone. God is our God and God alone. We are called to love God with, and love each other. And to make that love part of our lives, all that tying things to our hands and our foreheads, putting it on our doors and our gates for all we welcome in, is to make it really part of our lives. Because, repeat after me, God is our God and God alone. God is our God and God alone. This is the life we are called to live the life that will keep us free, the life we pass on to our children, saving us from the kinds of slavery we put ourselves into over and over again and giving us a better life than we deserve. That's what all of that stuff in Deuteronomy is about. God did this out of love. So be like God. And to be like God, we need to love knowing that God is our God and God alone. God is our God and God alone. We know all this, and we earnestly want to live that way. But sometimes it's difficult. We keep trying to find the limits, forgetting that love has no limits. And this is all about love, God's love. Because God is our God and God alone. God is our God and God alone. When we get the hang of that part, we're not far from God's kingdom. Not far, but not there. 
To be fair, Pharisees and Sadducees and religion scholars from the temple were all well-meaning people trying to be faithful. But they could not grasp the infinite love that God embodied and wants us to live out. Luther and Calvin and Zwingli, Menno and Cramner and Valdez, Servetus and Erasmus, all the 16th century reformers, and so many others were well-meaning, trying to be faithful, but they could not see how infinite love means infinite possibilities and infinite patience. Even as we celebrate the church's reformation, we must recognize and lament how it broke the body of Christ. Even as we celebrate the church's reformation, we must recognize and remember that we still need reformation. We're not there yet. We're close. Reformation is not a day. Reformation is not an event in the history books. We need to keep living into Reformation, being reformed by God's love day after day after day until God is our God and God alone. God is our God and God alone. We are living into a very tangible Reformation right now in this congregation as we have been for a few years, our faces have changed and soon our place will change. We are 295 years into this ministry and God is reforming us for what comes next because we're not done yet. Some of that reformation comes every day as we confess and are forgiven and start over as we become better stewards of God's gifts, that stewardship stuff I was talking about to the children, as we try to live each day more and more like God. Day after day, step by step, we need to keep living into reformation. Jonathan, here's the place to turn the share back on. I invite you to look at the chart that's in your bulletin, the chart that I think is coming up on your screen right now, though the way Zoom has been today. We'll just cross our fingers. Where are you on that chart? How much do you live like God? How much do you trust God? How do you go one more step? I hope that you'll be praying all this week, as we get ready to recommit ourselves next Sunday, be praying this week on what our continuing reformation might look like. Pray about what kind of a next step you can take. Nobody has to go from zero to 10 right away. Nobody has to take huge leaps, just a step. While you pray, Remember God's love. Recognize how it reforms us all. Day by day. This reformation is not a day. It's not an event. It's the assurance that God is our God and God alone. God is our God and God alone. Let us pray. Write these words in our hearts, dear God, and help them to grow up in us the fruits of your spirit, to the honor and praise of your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Chris is going to play the hymn, and then we will all sing together.
again, I welcome everybody to worship this morning. Um, I hope that some of us are out there. There's, there's some folks showing up as participants on the screen. I hope everybody's able to follow along. Um, and this will be the time when we're getting ready for sharing joys and concerns. So I would invite you to go ahead and turn your mutes off or press star six and be ready for that. While you're doing that, I'm going to remind you of just a few things. At the end of worship today, we're scheduled to have a town hall meeting to talk about our move to 1212 Livingston Avenue. Today is our last day for bringing in boxes of stuffing mix. Well, if you didn't get them over here today, get them over here on Wednesday and Nobody's going to be paying attention to the fact that it's stuffing mix and now it's November. It'll still get to people and it'll help them. And then you'll see in your bulletin the, the little flyer for Cornvember. So we'll be collecting cans of corn. So be thinking about that for the next few weeks as we share with our mission partnership and feed folks here in New Brunswick. Um, Wednesday is the day to the deadline for getting names of friends and family who have passed in the past year into the church office for next Sunday's prayers for the Sunday after All Saints. And Saturday, daylight savings time ends. Well, actually, it ends Sunday at two in the morning. So if you really want to, I suppose you can set your clock alarm for two o'clock. So you can wake up, change all your clocks back an hour, change all your smoke detector batteries, and go back to bed. But you just might, because lots of people do this, I hear, change it before you go to bed Saturday night and fix the batteries so that the batteries are still working. Even if they've still got charge in them now, just change them now. It's better for being safe. So next Sunday is the Sunday after All Saints, and we'll have worship in person and on Zoom. We'll celebrate the Lord's Supper. Um, we will remember in prayer the folks who've died in the past year who are near and dear to us, and we will recommit our stewardship of God's gifts, and we'll do that as part of our Sunday next Sunday. So plan to be here. Plan for, you know, let your friends who are in the congregation know they should be here because we'll, we'll do a lot of stuff and then at the end of the worship we'll have fellowship time together and all be part of this. So all of those things are coming up just this week and then we've still got the rest of November and Thanksgiving is coming and we are today 28 days away from the start of Advent. So get ready. Um, is there, do any, does anybody have any special joys and concerns we need to remember? I'm not hearing anything, but this may just be because. Good morning, Pastor. Uh, this is Carol speaking. Hi, Carol. <clears throat> uh, as Christians, I feel it is our responsibility on Tuesday to cast our ballots. And if you oh, haven't already yes. done so in the early balloting, Tuesday is the day. So Carol's reminding us we should all be voting and be in prayer about that the voting all goes well, not only here in New Jersey, but um, all around the country. And when I say goes well, I'm not talking about who we vote for, just that we all manage to do it and we don't manage to, you know, lose ballots and have mess and arguments over things that we never used to have arguments over. Anybody else? I have, uh, Pastor James. Is this on? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Pastor James, I have... Uh, Three. Well, actually, Carol covered the one about the elections, so that's great. Uh, uh, I have a prayer for God's guidance for Linda as she 
contemplates a, a change in her career, a change in, in, uh, in her, her uh, work. In the remaining years she's going to be working, she's uh, planning to retire from the library and mm -hmm. move on. So prayers for her guidance, for God's guidance for her. And prayers of thanksgiving to God uh, uh, for, for me. Uh, you uh, all don't know, but I've been going through a whole bunch of tests over the last two or three weeks, and uh, happily the results have been have been good, and so I, I thank God for that. Okay, so those are wonderful things to be praying for. Um, Linda, if you are listening, we know that um, you know. Ball players and all those folks retire when they're what about 35. So, so librarians, it must be you're only 33, right? Yep. Okay, what's good? Martha. Uh, yes, I would just ask for continued prayers for my neighbor Doug, who I uh, brought to us a couple weeks ago. He mm -hmm. still struggles with a rare form of cancer and okay. um, just needs to know he's loved and cared for. Yep. So, prayers for Doug. Sam? Yeah, uh, prayer of thanksgiving for being able to come to this sanctuary today. Ah. Yeah. So we have a nice little crowd here in the sanctuary now um, and we we could still have a few more before we reach our COVID limits but um, it is nice each week to have a few more people here worshiping with us not that I wasn't having a wonderful time just with Chris and Helen but um, you know I'm sure that they they're glad they've got somebody around here besides me Anybody else? Prayers for Martha's problems that are Okay. Prayers for Martha. Okay, Please prayers for there. Martha. And, for and continued prayers for Bassi. And for Bassi Aja. For O'Neilly. And for O'Neilly. And lots of folks who've been struggling with health issues. And those who are Grace. Oh, and yes, and for those who are mourning, and especially for Grace. And for Rita. And Rita as well. There's been a lot of that going on. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Um, last week, Carol shared with us about why she gives as we get ready for our recommitment. And today, Beatrice is going to share. And since Beatrice is right here in the room, we're going to do this really low tech thing where I'm going to invite Beatrice to come up here and stand so that they can, so that folks can see you. <laughs> and I'm going to go sit in a chair. <laughs> I was born and raised in Pentecostal family. Gospel teachings were a central part in upbringing of my siblings and I, which was naturally involved in our daily conversations. I joined Presbyterian Church during my college years, and I've stayed ever since. Through these journeys, my religious life, there is one foundation, which is to love thy neighbor as yourself. Volunteer at all levels in life and offer a helping hand when feasible. Talk about stewardship. We must give as much as we can to church of worships, not only in monetary contributions, but also in other forms of voluntary services. We should also be willing to help uplift the poor and the weakness 
among us in all walks of life. I once saw a quotation online which has stuck with me for the last couple of years. It goes as following. Stewardship generates gratitude. Gratitude generates generosity. Let us learn to live together with love and respect. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Beatrice. And I want, I want this to be proof for everybody else. See, you can, you can get up and you can talk in church and the, the floor does not open up and swallow you. I promise it won't do that in the new place either. It really won't. And everything is okay and you survive and you do a wonderful job. Because next year, we're going to do steward, we'll be doing stewardship again sometime in the fall, and I will be calling on other people. And Carol and Beatrice have both taken their turns. So <laughs> some of you who I'm looking at right now, it's going to be your turn. Be ready. Okay. I remind you that in Corinthian, 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. The one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Responding to God's bountiful gifts to us in Christ, we have an opportunity to share out of our abundance. Let us now with gladness present our tithes and our offerings from our life and our labor unto God while Chris is playing. Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us join our hearts and our minds in prayer together. Here we are gathered to be your church, O God, called from the entire human family, called to love one another, called to experience, practice, and pursue community together sharing one faith, one calling, one soul and mind, having one God and Father, filled with one spirit, baptized in one spirit, eating one bread and drinking of one cup, confessing one name, confessing one Lord, working for one cause and sharing one hope. Here we are, come to know the height and the breadth and the depth of the love of Christ, to be built up to the stature of Christ, the new humanity. Here we are, belonging body and soul in life and in death to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. God, our consuming fire, hear us and help us. Here we are, building one another up looking out for each other. And so we pray for those who need special nurture today. 
We pray especially for Doug and for Martha and Bassie as they continue their recovery, for O'Neill, for others who are ill or infirm, for Linda as she looks to what her next steps are. We give thanks for Tom's good news on his tests. We give thanks for Sam and for others being back here in worship and for all of us being able to do things that we used to little by little. We pray for those who mourn, especially for Grace and for Rita. We pray for everyone whose names we remember in our hearts and those whose names we don't know yet. God, our consuming fire, hear us and help us. Here we are called to be the salt of the earth and the light for the world, called, to, called blessed because we are to be peacemakers, enabled by your life-giving word and spirit to live in a new obedience and to offer new possibilities for life to society and to the world. And so, daunted by all of this, we pray for ourselves, your holy church, for this congregation gathered here, for our sisters and brothers in and around New Brunswick, for churches of the Presbytery of the Coastlands and the Presbyterian Church USA, for colleges, seminaries, missions, and ministries, for everyone who proclaims your good news wherever they might be. God, our consuming fire, hear us and help us. Here we are, knowing you are the one who wishes to bring about true justice and peace among us all, knowing you are in a special way the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wronged, called to bring justice to the oppressed, give bread to the hungry, free the prisoners, restore sight to the blind, support the downtrodden, protect the stranger, he help orphans and widows, and block the path of the ungodly. And so we pray for your world and for all the people in it, especially those who are in places of conflict or danger this day. People putting their lives back together after natural disasters, people running for their lives from violence and war and conflict. And we pray for those who lay down their lives, for the safety of those brothers and sisters and neighbors wherever they might be. And we pray for all of us as we get ready for elections here in this country, as we seek to be faithful citizens in many places. And we pray for those who lead us, for our president and representatives, our governor and legislators, people who administer the affairs of our nation, our state, our cities and towns, and those administering nations and states and cities and towns all around this world. For the leaders at the Global Climate Conference in Glasgow, that they may not just say good words and take nice photos, but actually make and carry out decisions to help us all. God, our consuming fire, hear us and help us. Here we are, called to confess and do all these things, even if human authorities and laws oppose us. For Jesus is Lord, and in his name we boldly pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Chris is going to play through the hymn, and then we will all sing.
listen to Chris play and then we will go right into our little congregational meeting. It should be very short but share some good information I hope. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are God's own people in order that together we may proclaim the mighty acts of the one who calls us out of darkness and into God's marvelous light. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all this day and always, and may all God's people say together, Amen. shall we, so that um, folks, well, yeah, because then folks who are, aren't here can find out what we were talking about. It'll be, it'll be fine, unless, you know, unless there's some top secret that we don't want to let people know where we're moving to, <laughs> which I think kind of counters the purpose of what we do the rest of the time in, ch in church. Um, we will, we will plan on that. I'm just calling up something so that Okay, recording is still in progress. Good. And we will um, call something. I'm calling something up, I hope. Come on. Okay, there you are. I'm just calling up the Zoom so that I can... Dot com so that I can share something with everybody. joining the meeting with another device, mostly so that I can share a PowerPoint with everybody, and so you can follow along. Um, for We finished the purchase of the property stuff in July, right? Yes. Okay. And um, since then, we've been working on creating a plan and beginning to execute a plan for moving over there. We've been dealing with lots of things like making sure there was insurance in place and good stuff like that. Um, Lawrence Aja very kindly drew up some plans for us to share um, and um, for, how, for things that we decided that we needed to get done in the sanctuary building. Those have been drawn up 
We are in the process of finding a contractor and engaging a contractor and um, doing that. But I want to be, we wanted to be able to share that there is a plan and give you an idea of timeline and also how everybody can help. So I'm going to remind myself what I need to do here. Okay, that's what I need. And come on. Uh, there we are. I'm going to find the little PowerPoint, and then I'm going to ask Chris to give me the power to share PowerPoint here. Can I be given power to share my... Okay, cool. Um, wow, yes. So you have to... This One of the wonderful things about Zoom, I think, for the church is that we keep having to ask each other for things now. <laughs> we, can't just, we can't just blurt things out in a meeting anymore because it's not how stuff works for us. So let's get that ready. Okay, but that's not going to help me. Okay, so I have power and can do this, I hope. Sorry about the delay, folks. This is because if I was... Some of this also just taxes the limits of pastor's little brains. Um, that's okay. No, you're fine. Yep, well, and this is this is the point where I'm a Luddite, so... Okay. Now you should be able to see a screen that I am sharing, which says things to be done to move to 1212 Livingston Avenue. Um, so there's, there's the first set of steps. There's, here are the things we've been looking at. Um, the exterior of the building we need to work on um, both um, a step at the having steps at the rear of the building, which are already there, but to have a ramp as well so that we can have people who have trouble walking actually be able to get in and out of the building. We need to work on signage out in the front um, so that there is a sign that is visible from the street. One of the drawbacks is the way that the front is landscaped and the sign is set up you can drive past this place and not see it at all. In fact, the number of people who I've said um, over the last couple of months, oh yeah, we've got this building and we're moving to 1212 Livingston Avenue. And they said, well, where on Livingston Avenue is that? And these are people who live around here and do this all the time. And I tell them and they say, there's a church there? Because you drive by and but they've got wonderful shrubbery and trees so that it just looks like maybe there's another house tucked in, way back in behind the woods. And so we're trying to make it visible. So the other part of that is landscaping. And so that the church is actually visible again I, because they're, they're lovely plants, but you really can't see the building except when you're right on top of it. And stopping short on a busy street in New Jersey, we all know is a really bad idea. Um, so all of that needs to be done. Tr there's some tree pruning that has to be done um, during the storms we've had recently. A couple of pieces of tree have fallen on the building or on the wires leading to the building, and we're trying to make sure that doesn't happen anymore. Um, we want to put guards on the gutters so that they don't get clogged with leaves. So all of those things are on our to-do list. In the sanctuary... We want to remove pews. We want to build a narthex, an entry, a, a front lobby kind of a place, so that, for, for one thing, when you open the doors in the winter, the cold air does not immediately join everyone else in the room. And by the way, when you open the doors in the summer, you are not immediately letting out the air conditioning that's in there um, and sharing that with North Brunswick instead. Um, we want to build um, an accessible bathroom on that floor because the only bathrooms are downstairs. And if we've now invited people who have trouble with stairs into the building and then said, well, you know, if you have to go before the end of worship, that's really too bad for you. That's not the most hospitable thing we could do. So we're going to have a bathroom. We need to build and create an area for the streaming equipment. We've got one in the back corner of this, this room that you guys don't see most of the time because that's where the camera is pointing at me. 
So all of those things need to happen inside the sanctuary. And those are things, those and the um, barrier-free entrance are things that we really need to have happen before we move over there. Because once we move over uh, for, for worship, because once we move over there for worship, we're kind of there and people need to be able to do stuff. Um, if we move the offices later, we can work that out. And we've talked about that, and that may happen in stages. Um, on the lower level, we need to build a church office and a pastor's office. There's a place in the lower level where that can be done, and Lawrence has already created the designs, and contractor has already been looking at them and all of that. And they'll be side by side, so, but a place, for one thing, for our office equipment to be, for the safe to be, a place where the door can be locked, um, a place where pastor can put his robes on and suddenly remember that he didn't put his microphone on before worship <laughs> um, rather than the way we did it this week. Um, and we need to add a new lift on the stairs so that people who've been, a been welcomed into the upstairs can also be welcomed into the downstairs when we have fellowship and things there. So all of those things need to happen. We are going to have to move stuff when, when it's time. We're going to have to move the piano. We're going to have to move sanctuary furniture. We're going to have to move all of our electronic sound and streaming tech from here and set it up over there, which is another part of why once we move the, the worship, we've moved the worship. We can't just move the worship over there for a week because we'd have to disconnect everything and take it down, move it over there, set it up, and then move it back in that not a pro proposal that any of us want to contemplate. Um, we need to, we'll need to move chairs and tables and office and meeting furniture and the safe, which I'm sure is a heavy thing. Um, and all sorts of miscellany will have to be moved. So that's another piece of what we're looking at doing. And last of all, we've got some other tasks to be done. We need to find, a care ta find and engage a caretaker who will be able to look after the building and come and, you know, maybe even somebody who will do some of the cleanup from time to time, but certainly keeping an eye on the building when we're not there. Um, we need to be looking to find a new office manager because um, Helen Bird lovingly and faithfully said how many years ago that she would do this for a little while. Um, and, you know, I know that you know, Moses said to God, I'll, I'll go and lead your people for a little while, and it was 40 plus years, but um, none of us are God, and Helen's not Moses, and so we're, not, we're trying to come up with a more reasonable schedule than that. Um, and so we are in the process of looking for somebody who would be our office manager and take care of those, those administrative tasks probably one day a week, um, but keeping that in mind. So that's one of the things we need to do as we're getting ready for this move. Um, we need to be looking to find renters and community groups to be using the building so that it's not just sitting empty during the week because that's a really poor stewardship of this gift God has given us. And because, you know, renter, if there are people especially paying rent or at least contributing towards the upkeep of the building, that's better for us and making use of it in those times when we're not. We need to begin considering ministries in that new place. What is, this, what is this new place going to suggest for us that we can be doing in ministry for the rest of the world? And we need to be inviting the neighborhood in. So we've got lots of different things that need to be done in the next, um, the next however many weeks we've got. And in fact, we do have an idea, or at least a hoped for timeline for all of this. Our target date for moving at least worship is March 2nd, which is Ash Wednesday. We are hoping that by the beginning of Lent, we've got enough things done that we can move worship over to 1212 and begin worshiping there so that we're really all settled in by the time Easter comes. We don't really... You know, as wonderful as it might sound to say Easter would be our first Sunday, Chris and I can both tell you that we really don't want our first Sunday in the new place to be a big Sunday like Easter because 
we don't want to suddenly find out the thing that we forgot <laughs> or the thing that doesn't work quite right on Easter Sunday. We'd like to find out on a somewhat more quiet Sunday. Like, I'm really glad that today wasn't Christmas because, you know, the beginning of worship was kind of original. Um, and so that's our hope, is that by March 2nd, we'll be able to move worship over there. If, we, if by March 2nd, we're able to move the whole kit and caboodle, then we will rejoice and be glad and have a bigger party. But we're at least getting worship over there by then. And the last thing for us to remember is that our deadline for moving everything and being out of this place is the end of April in 2023. So two years, so, well, now basically about 18 months from where we are today, almost exactly 18 months from where we are today, it is time for us to be moved to someplace new. So that's what we're looking at. Um, anybody have any questions, comments, suggestions? Somebody who knows a piano mover and would love to do it for free? Pastor James, this piano is Carol. Hi, Carol. Um, a question about the exterior, well, and maybe interior. Uh, do we plan on installing security cameras since this building will be vacant quite a bit between now and at do, least the time that we move? We do not currently plan on installing security cameras. We have um, folks who've been regularly going and checking on the place, including Martha, um, regularly going and checking on the place. <coughs> we have a pretty good relationship with our neighbors right now. And so our neighbors have been looking at after things and they give Martha a call if anything co comes up. So, and we do have, we do have an alarm, right? No, not an, just, oh, the, the, fire. the fire alarm. We have fire alarms. Okay. Not an entry alarm, but so yeah. there are, Okay. If you didn't hear that, Martha was saying we could do that for a very nominal fee and very reasonably. And I think to be perfectly honest, it's something the session just didn't look at yeah. yet. We just didn't think about yet. So um, thanks. Thanks, Carol. And that's well, another reason we're having this town hall meeting is because we don't all think of things. Sam. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, since we're going to have a lift for disabled to, to be able to go uh, to the basement, is it, <clears throat> is it uh, still necessary to have a bathroom for upstairs? I will speak to you as the husband of a person who uses a walker. Um, and who has ridden on those lifts that go up and down the stairs and the speed at which they go up and down the stairs? Yes. Um, trust me, if you suddenly needed to go to the bathroom and you had to wait for one of those things to get you to the bathroom, <laughs> you would be saying a whole new kind of prayer. <laughs> Uh, Pastor, this is Carol again. Uh, under other tasks, uh, find renters and community groups. Um, do we have the proper insurance to cover renters or community groups who would, would be coming in to the church? 
as I understand it, we have the proper insurance to add riders onto when we have renters or community groups actually coming. Yes, uh, we can we can modify our insurance when we have renters. I, I, we can we're certainly not, we're ask not, and modify. Yes. Yeah. Helen says yes. Nothing is written in stone except the Ten Commandments, as far as I know. Um, <laughs> so we just want to make the church as inviting as possible. Um, and and uh, Lawrence said he will be pretty much back up to speed by the end of next week, uh, by the end of this coming, of this week. Uh, he's planning to have a professional come walk through and look at the audiovisual that we have here, then walk through the chapel, see what remains there, and see exactly what we need to purchase and or move from here to there, with the idea that when it happens, it'll all have to happen in one week, because if we're moving stuff from here to there, we'll be broadcasting here one week and then broadcasting there the following so he's planning to do that with a professional the um, the contractor is we had a little hiccup with him but um, he's back on task and should give us general a general ballpark figure hopefully by the end of this week and we can report that um, yeah so we had we as I said we closed in July August just kind of dissolved, and then since September, Lawrence and I have been sort of sidelined. And uh, but I think we're we're getting back on track here, and things are starting to move along. Pastor, this is Carol again. I'm sorry to keep Hi, asking Carol. questions, but no, no, no. Uh, good good uh, questions. Does a session have a budget for all of these things that need to be done where there are expenses involved yes the session has a budget for all of these things um and i don't remember what it was that we're set of oh seventy thousand dollars is currently in the budget some of it's already been spent but seventy thousand is still there and obviously you know Budgets are what they are, so if we start to bigger numbers than what we had planned in the budget, we either have to change the plan or change the budget. And we'll figure out what, which one we need to do when we get there. But yes, we're thinking it's right in our thinking and right in front of us. Anybody else? Any other questions? Okay, Sam has another question. He's working on the microphone. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> since we're going to have a, the bathroom, you know, on that same, uh, you know, are we going to have something to uh, keep the smell out of, uh, you know? <laughs> 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 yeah, we'll be Sam, Sam, okay. Sam <laughs> I, can, I can tell you that the reason Lawrence put the bathroom where he's put the bathroom is that it's next to the vent okay. so that the smell goes outside. We will also, we will also invest in insulation in the wall so that in the middle of my sermon we do not hear a flushing sound. <laughs> Or somebody will decide that, no, we should hear flushing sounds in the middle of pastor's <laughs> sermons. <laughs> in which case, we'll try that. Anybody else? Any other questions? Things may come up in your minds as you reflect on all of this. On over, and over the next few weeks, and months um, when you do call a member of the session call one of the elders call me um, and send us an email and we will you know we'll look at whatever that is and we'll see how we need to deal with that that uh, that thing and say oh we'll come and look at it 
Um, also, over the next few weeks or months, you may think of ways that you can help out. Uh, Martha mentioned that a lot has been resting on her and Lawrence. And when she had health issues and Lawrence had to worry about his family, things slowed way down. There are a lot of us in this congregation besides Martha and Lawrence. Not everybody is an architect, and so they can't do what Lawrence does, but there's lots of stuff that can be done that doesn't require being an architect. Um, recently, after the storm, uh, the cable that provided the Wi-Fi for the church was knocked down in the storm, and somebody needed to be, we needed to schedule Verizon coming at a time when somebody could sit in the building, you know, for the, you know how Verizon is. Between nine and when Santa Claus arrives, <laughs> we'll show up. And, um, and so now Barbara is going to take on that project. She's going to be there. But there are lots of things like that that are just somebody being at the building. You don't need any ex special expertise. We can get you a key. We can do all those things, but it's just um, following through on those kinds of things. So if you can be somebody who can help out with that kind of stuff or, and be on call, and yeah, maybe we're going to call you sometime and, okay, this is a bad day for me, and we'll call you another time again. That's fine. The more people we have who can share the work, the faster the work is going to go. Oh, and by the way, I just realized that um, the filter on my own personal um, laptop, you, you're seeing a lovely picture behind me. It is not our new chapel at 1212 Livingston Avenue. It's the chapel at New Brunswick Seminary. This is because the other day I had to lead online chapel for the seminary, and I never changed the screen back. So it's a very pretty it's a very pretty room, but it's not our chapel. But um, very soon you'll get to see our chapel, and I hope everybody can be there. Any other questions, thoughts, concerns? Pastor James, this is Carol again. Yeah, Carol. I I see yep. under this san sanctuary, it says remove pews. Um, will, will that necessitate, I, I don't know if there's carpeting or tile or wood on the floor there, will that necessitate uh, doing any kind of repairs to the floor? We're not sure yet. And that is why it doesn't say remove all the pews yet. Um, my personal preference would be to remove most, if not all, the pews for a couple of reasons. One, the room is set up for about, um, what, 120-some to sit in. And so if our congregation sits there with those pews, it will always look like it's empty and we'll feel depressed. Two, um, you may remember before the pandemic, we rearranged the sanctuary because we were set up like it was pews in here, and every time people got up to pass the peace, we all got stuck in the center aisle and we couldn't move. And we don't want to do that there. But we, want, we also need to see what's under the floor, under the pews, on the floor, under the pews. And there are a couple of pews that have to be taken out anyway. So we're going to take those out and we're going to get an idea of what we're up against and then we will decide what, what we do next. And we'll find out how much what we do next has to cost. So we're not, we're not absolutely sure. There's carpet there now. Anybody else? So, it's, this is where we're at. This is very exciting. 
and a little bit daunting. And God has already got a plan for how we're going to get there. And we have to figure out what the plan is. And when we figure it out and when we get ourselves ready, the plan's going to work. Everybody be in prayer about this, please. Everybody be thinking about how can I help? Maybe you can't help personally, but very seriously, if you know a piano mover, let us know because we're going to have to move a piano out of this basement up Livingston Avenue and into the new building. And I have moved, I have moved pianos up about three steps with about six other people helping me, and it was still quite a job. <coughs> so we want a piano mover. Chris and I are not moving the piano. Um, but it's coming. So think about things like that. You know, I know a landscaper. I know somebody who could help us with floor. I know a carpenter or a woodworker who'd like to take those used pews and make things out of them instead of them going into a landfill. All of those are good things we need to be thinking about and we, are, we have been thinking about, but we need answers. So if you've got those answers, share them. And in the meantime, keep this in prayer each and every day. And be excited. And be excited. <laughs> Bar Barbara's excited, I can tell you. Um, and others are excited, so share in that. Um, I'm going to try to make sure that in next week's newsletter we put this, this list that I've put on the screen for you all um, so that we have that and maybe keep that in front of us all the time for the next several weeks. I'm going to one last call for if anybody else wants to say anything, ask anything, then I'm going to adjourn us with prayer. Let's all pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of this day, the gifts you've brought us with it, for the gift of a new place, and the plans that you have for us to do ministry there. We thank you for the gift of the resources to get that place and prepare that place, including the resources among us that we haven't yet found. Help us to find those resources. Help us to use all of our gifts that we may make this move and grow as your church reformed for the next three centuries all to your honor and glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.